I believe this is it right here. That is it, yeah. Yes. I mean, to think of the, the fact that we are able to build a million uh, qubit quantum computer in a thing of this size is just unbelievable. Like, I mean, that, and, and that's, the, I think, the crux of it, right? Which is unless and until we could do that, you can't dream of building a utility scale quantum computer. Mm. And you're saying the eventual million qubits will go on a chip that's this it. size. That's okay, right. Amazing. The fundamental breakthrough here, or the vision that we've always had is, you need a physics breakthrough. Uh, in order to build a utility scale quantum computer that works. Um, and so we took that path, you know, uh, which was uh, the path of sort of saying, look, the one way for having that less noisy or the more reliable qubit is to bet on a physical property that by definition um, is more reliable. And that's kind of what led us to this Majorana uh, zero modes as the thing to go, um, which was theorized in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And so, so the question was, can we actually physically fabricate these things? Mm -hmm. Can we actually build them? So the big breakthrough effectively, and I know you talked to Chetan, was um, that we now finally have existence proof uh, and a physics breakthrough of a Majorana zero modes um, in a new phase of matter effectively, right? So we did this, this is why I think we like the analogy of thinking of this as the transistor moment of quantum computing where we effectively have a new uh, phase which is the topological phase where, uh, which is more reliable, which, which, which means we can even now uh, reliably hide the quantum information mm -hmm. and measure it. Uh, and then, and we can fabricate it. And so now that we have it, we feel like with that core foundational um, fabrication technique uh, out of the way, we can start building a Majorana chip uh, that Majorana 1, which I think is going to basically be the first chip that will be capable of a million qubits physical. And then on that, thousands, a mil thousands of uh, logical qubits mm -hmm. error corrected. And then it game on, right? So then you can't, suddenly have now got the ability to build a real utility square quantum computer. And that to me is now so much more feasible, right? We've been working, because without something like this, you will still be able to achieve milestones, but you'll never be able to build a utility scale computer. And so that's why we're excited about it. Amazing. The um, the the million uh, topological qubits, thousands of logical qubits, what is the estimated timeline to scale up to that level? What, yeah. what is the Moore's law here if you've got the first transistor look like? Like we've obviously been working on this for 30 years. I'm glad we now have... Uh, the fabrication, uh, the physics breakthrough, and the fabrication breakthrough. I mean, this is—I mean, I mean, I wish we had a quantum computer because, by the way, the first thing the quantum computer will allow us to do is build quantum computers because it's <laughs> going to be so much easier to simulate uh, atom by atom construction of these new quantum gates, essentially. But in any case, uh, to me, I think the next real thing is now that we have the fabrication technique, uh, let us go build that first fault-tolerant quantum computer. Um, and that'll be the logical thing. So I would say now I can say, oh, maybe 27, 28, 29, mm. we, it, we will be able to actually build this, right? So now that we have this one gate, can I, and I put the thing into an in integrated circuit and then actually put these integrated circuits into a real computer, uh, that I think is where the next logical step is. And what do you see as 27, 28, you've got it working. Is it... Um, is it like a thing you access through the API? Is it something you're using internally for your own research in it's a great materials question. and chemistry? See, one thing that I've been excited about is even in today's world, right? Um, because we were we had this quantum program and we had it, we could say, hey, here's you know some APIs to it. The breakthrough we had maybe two years ago was to sort of think of this HPC stack and AI stack and quantum together. In fact, if you think about it, right, um, AI is like an emulator um, of the simulator. Like quantum is like a simulator of nature. Like what what is what quantum going to do? By the way, uh, quantum is not going to replace classical, right? Quantum is great at mm -hmm. what quantum can do, and classical will be also because you can't like I mean like to be able to 
the quantum is going to be fantastic for anything that is not data heavy, but it's got more exploration heavy in terms of the state space, right? So which is, it should be data light, but exponential states that you want to explore. And you know, simulation is a great one, uh, chemical, physics, what have you, biology. Uh, so one of the things that we've started doing is really using AI as the emulation engine but you can then train. So the way I think of it as, you know, if you have AI plus quantum, maybe you will use quantum to generate synthetic data that then gets used by AI to train better models that know how to model something like chemistry or physics or what have you. And, and these two things will get used together. So even today, that's kind of effectively what we're doing with the combination of HPC and AI. And I hope to replace some of the HPC pieces with quantum computers.